Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How are you today, Bob? I am doing great, Michael. How are you doing? I'm all good this end. Got up early for a podcast with Benjamin Percy, and I'm really looking forward to this. There's so many directions that this conversation could go in. Great author. Most recently, he released The Dark Net. Also, he released Deadlands. And the novel that first turned me on to Benjamin Percy was his werewolf novel, Red Moon. But on top of that, he is really establishing himself within the comic medium, most notably Green Arrow, and... I would say that he released the best on writing book last year, Thrill Me. And I haven't even mentioned his literary fiction. I mean, he got his story in 100 years of the best American short story, which is my favourite yearly short story anthology. So, really stoked it's going to be a treat talking with Benjamin Percy. Yes, I'm I'm really, really excited. Uh, I'm reading The Dark Net, which just came out, and um, people that follow me on social media will know when I say that, hey, you know, if you get to the, like, the first couple of pages, you, you know a book's going to be good. Uh, yeah, this one uh, is, is going to be really good. Uh, I stayed up quite late last night reading. I uh, actually had to, to force myself to put the, the book down just so I could get some sleep. So it's, it's, uh, man, and thrill me, uh, his essays on fiction, love it, love it. And you're right, it is one of the best books that's out there. Definitely. Well, before we get him on the show, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. How well do you know the people you chat with online? 37-year-old Ellie Blake is about to find out when she joins a dark online forum seeking a suicide partner. When she meets Laurie, she thinks she's going to a nowhere hotel for a night of sex, torture, and suicide. But what awaits her is a sadistic force even suicide offers no escape from. He might be God or maybe the devil, but in the end, he wants all of humanity brought to his knees. Award-winning author Nicole Cushions, The Sadist Bible, is cosmic, transgressive, suspenseful. A story that has not been since Clive Barker's Hellbound Heart. From Zero One Publishing, The Sadist Bible is available on Audible and where paperbacks and ebooks are sold. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Okay, well, I believe, Bob, that you have Benjamin Percy's bio. Yes, I do. Benjamin Percy is an award-winning novelist, comics writer, and screenwriter. His new novel, The Dark Net, has just recently released. He is also the author of the novels The Deadlands, Red Moon, and The Wildling, as well as two books of stories, Refresh, Refresh, and The Language of Elk. He is also the author of a book of essays, Thrill Me, Essays on Fiction, that was published by Gray, Press, Gray Wolf Press in the fall of 2016. He currently writes for Green Arrow and Teen Titans for DC Comics, and has written for James Bond series for Dynamite, and did a uh, two-story arc uh, with uh, Detective Comics uh, featuring Batman. And that is Ben Percy. Okay, and with that said, let's do it. Let's get Benjamin Percy on the This Is Horror podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. Ben, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I know, to begin with, if we could talk about your family and life growing up, some of your earliest memories. Yeah, you bet. Um, I grew up in the woods. I grew up uh, in Oregon, rural Oregon, and we had 27 acres of big pines. And my parents were, for a time, back to the landers. So we essentially lived off the grid. Uh, We had electricity, but my 
you know, my mom grew all of our vegetables and we had a chicken coop and fruit trees and a cow and my father hunted a lot of our meat. So I grew up eating venison and elk and bear. That's why I sound like this. Right. <laughs> yeah. Steady, healthy diet of bear. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, it, I think that this was all training in a way for for my life later as a novelist because uh, so much of my time was spent alone, you know, with the exception of my trusty sidekick, Heidi, a German shepherd. Um, and and I would be off in the woods building tree houses or in the river making a dam or ducking under a barbed wire fence with a slingshot. And I also was spending a lot of time reading. Um, my parents were our obsessive readers. And I know it sounds really romantic to, to talk about, but it seems like every single night when when we weren't watching Kung Fu, The Legend Continues anyway, um, you know, we were all sprawled out on the living room floor reading. My dad would be reading, would be reading science fiction novels, and my mom might be reading westerns. And uh, my sister typically was reading some sort of phys book on physics. Um, she was always quite the brain. And, you know, I would be reading some mass market paperback with an embossed title. And it probably had a dragon or a robot or a demon on the cover. Um, so uh, I, I grew up sort of in a, in a non-traditional way in many ways. Um, another thing that a lot of people find fascinating is that my, my parents are rock hounds. So what I mean by that is they are obsessed with fossils and they're obsessed with uh, gems. And almost every vacation growing up was spent off in the wilderness and we were, you know, we were camping and we were hiking and we were fishing and we were hunting, but we were also, you know, looking for petrified wood or, or geodes or, or something of, of that nature that my father would have these geologic surveys laid out uh, on the dashboard of the pickup truck and his 357 revolver would be balanced on top of it. And in the back of the truck would be, you know, our fishing poles, but also pickaxes and um, shovels. And, you know, we'd be going down these logging roads into the middle of nowhere, beyond the middle of nowhere, to the edge of nowhere. And, and you know, he'd suddenly slam on the brakes and say, get out. And we'd all jump out of the truck and we'd be, we'd all have whistles in case we got lost. And we'd be circling and circling and circling, trying to find these veins of quartz or trying to find uh, these rock art sites that were rumored to be in the area or whatever. And, and instead of going to Disney World, that's what I was doing. So that, all that gives you, you know, sort of a long-winded way of telling you a little bit about the way in which I was raised, which is strangely. <laughs> no, I'm really glad that I opened with that question. I mean, I've done it a few times before, but that is maybe the most interesting answer I've received. And I, I wonder, so what did you learn from off the grid living that you've now applied to your life today? Well, I, you know, I guess if the apocalypse came, I might be better prepared than some. Uh, but, you know, these days I live a uh, pretty standard life. I mean, I do live in the woods, um, but... You know, we have five acres of land. We don't have 27 acres and I don't have a chicken coop and I don't hunt all of my meat or anything like that. <laughs> I, you know, we, we, we live just outside of town and I, you know, I still feel calmest. I still feel most sort of plugged into myself when I'm surrounded by trees or when I'm, you know, at the edge of a lake. Um, but, you know, my life is spent the majority of it is spent indoors that wasn't the, that wasn't true of my childhood but it's it's true of my life now i'm anchored to the desk um but the thing is that that kind of upbringing you know it imprints itself on you like a fossil um that i think it was flannery o'connor i'm sure i'm butchering the phrase 
But Flannery O'Connor talked about how, you know, seven years of a Southern childhood gave her enough stories for the rest of her life. And I think that, you know, there's something to be said about that, that the way in which you're raised, like, you're always going to carry that with you. And I don't think there's any, you know, there's no escaping Oregon as a stage for my fiction. Like, I know that place so well. Uh, and I know that some people live there and, you know, their Oregon is different than mine. You know, that a lot of people these days are indoorsmen instead of outdoorsmen. You know, you you spend your life going between Target and wherever you work in your home and the gym and, and, and a restaurant and that's about it. Um, and but for me, traveling all around like that, I, I feel like I know Oregon so well as a, you know, geographically and culturally and even politically because i was also navigating you know not just the more barren sections of the state the more rural sections of the state but visiting portland and salem where my grandparents lived often uh and also you know mythically i really understand the state mythically and as a result it's become it, it's become a kind of character in so much of my work now i've lived in the midwest i live in minnesota right now and i've lived in the midwest for a good decade. And I think I'm just starting to feel as attuned to it as I am to Oregon so that I, I'm going to make it, uh, you know, the setting of, of my next book. And, but it's taken that long. I feel like, you know, you, you really need to know a place inside and out if you're going to uh, manifest it on the page in a convincing way and make it truly three dimensional. And that's how I always treat you know, that's how I always treat setting in my stories. I treat I treat place like a person. Um, and you know, in, the, in, in my latest book, The Dark Net, that's true of Portland, o Portland, Oregon. I you know really made this urban environment uh, and it, sort of explicitly a character. Uh, whereas in my previous books, like uh, The Deadlands or The Wilding or Red Moon, you know, they're much more outdoorsy by comparison, and and they're you know, they're making the Pacific Northwest, the sort of wooded Pacific Northwest or the or the sage flats, the Pacific Northwest or the coast of the Pacific Northwest. They're making that more into the place that the characters traipse around on. It's a very different vibe than what I'm doing right now. Yeah, finding that you uh, use character, you know, place as character. That that's that's something that I that I find reading a, a lot of, of fiction you know, all the way back to Rosemary's Baby, you know, New York City, that, that basically the setting is a character. And I love that stuff. Uh, Stephen King, too. I mean, every, every, oh, you yeah. know, so many, some of them are set in Florida and some of them are set in, up, you know, outside of Maine. But Maine is like, Maine is his, is the king what Oregon is to me. Right. And it's just, uh, I, I just, I, lo I love hearing that. I didn't, I didn't really have a question. I just love that, man. It's just uh, because it's so. I think it's crucial to, to uh, especially to, to me. It's like to horror. It, it's, it's really crucial that that you have that that sense of place, and and place can become a character and often is a character in the story. Yeah, and sometimes you know you can think about it in, in two different ways. I think that there's. There's like place, there's setting as space, and there's setting as place. So setting as space, I guess I'm talking more about the immediate vicinity, you know, and how you render, say, this haunted house. You know, let's say you're Shirley Jackson, right. it's, and it's Hill House. Like, how are, you, how are you building up this house? How are you building up this living room or this basement or this attic to atmospherically... Uh, you know, impact the story as it moves forward. When I talk about setting, though, as, uh, as place, I guess I'm thinking a little bit more broader. And that's when I talk about the Pacific Northwest, or I talk about Oregon. And that's what I mean when, you know, Stephen King is talking about Derry, or he's talking about Maine. Um, you know, you're thinking about the geography, you're thinking about the politics, the culture, the the myths, as I, as I mentioned before. And, and thinking about, you know, it as a as a kind of character, and I don't know. It's it's essential, yeah. To look at Nathaniel Hawthorne, who you, you could refer to the Scarlet 
letter as a kind of horror or fantasy novel. You could, you can think of uh, young Goodman Brown certainly as a great horror story, and the woods of New England were that way to him. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at movies too, and thinking about oh, how are you know how is the camera working its way through uh, this cave system in a movie like The Descent. Or Rosemary ba Mary's Baby is a great example of the way that it makes, you know, that apartment building, that, that coven of witches, you know, that apartment building becomes so, so spooky when you hear the voices streaming through the wall. Uh, or when she wakes up, you know, and the ordinary environment is transformed into this hellish chamber. Um, I think it's essential for any writer, but uh, definitely the horror writer. Uh, it's a it's a great ingredient to add to your work. And you know, when I was I used to be a teacher, I used to be a professor, and I was teaching at Iowa State University for a while. And I would always ask the students, I'd say, you know, look at your backyard, look to your own backyard as the setting of your early work, especially because you know that place better than anybody. And I remember the students being like, uh, you know, my my backyard's boring. I don't want to write about it. And and it was Iowa, so maybe they had something of a point. But, you know, <laughs> we asked, I asked him to look a little closer. And, you know, here's, here's this, uh, this state where the cornfields march off into the distance. And, and, you know, Stephen King certainly took advantage of that with Children of the Corn. And look at what about the way that the clouds stack up like mountains? Uh, what about the way it's so flat that you can watch your dog run away for three days? What about the way that it floods every spring when the rains come down hard and, you know, uh, buildings get swept away and people are rowing their canoes down Main Street? What about the way that there's a hog butchering plant down the road and you can smell blood in the air? What about the way that uh, a place like Ames, Iowa, you know, a lot of uh, the Manhattan, early Manhattan trials experiment came out of there. And so there's nuclear waste buried beneath the soccer fields uh, that the kids play on in the town. Or how about that garbage burning facility uh, near the downtown where, you know, all the garbage in the community goes into it and it's incinerated at a temperature that's almost like as hot as the surface of the sun. And that's where the town gets its electricity. And that, that garbage burning facility is looming right over the main bandstand at the park. Like all of that stuff is great. And you probably know, you know, I'd ask the students about somebody in the, on the block you lived where somebody had an affair and, and maybe somebody else, maybe they, you know, maybe there's a murder there years ago and this one house you would always avoid. And, you know, we'd look closer and we'd look closer and we'd look closer and recognize that no matter how boring you think, uh, you know, your backyard is at first, like you can really make your own 40 acres come to life. Definitely. I agree with that 100%. It's, you don't have to look far you just have to, to think about it and be receptive and you can, yeah, you yeah. can, you can find it. It's out there. And where are you from? I feel like I'm hearing a little bit of a regional accent. <laughs> um, I'm in Texas. Texas. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, Texas is as interesting as it gets. Um, yeah, we've got everything here, man. We got desert, we got mountains, we got beach. I'm about an hour and a half away from the coast, so uh, yeah. and in, in some in some instances, probably within about 45 minutes away from the coast, we just don't go to that beach. But right. <laughs> you know, it's uh, and Stephen Stephen Graham Jones is he's a fantastic horror writer and a friend of mine, and you know he's got some Texas stories that are that are great. And, oh, definitely. Um, I don't know if you've read The Sun by Philip Meyer. It's another fantastic one, but Texas, Texas looms large in my imagination. I've only visited there a few times, but I've read so much good fiction, including Cormac McCarthy's set there that it feels like, uh, you know, uh, a place that I'm both impressed by and a little scared of because there's always <laughs> something bad in Texas fiction. Yeah. And of course, Joe Lansdale. So you can't go wrong there. That's right. Yeah. Bubba Hotel. Oh, definitely. <laughs> well, speaking of Texas and of setting, I mean, one of the things you said in Thrill Me is to use setting to serve the mood and the theme. And the example that you gave was in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 
just as the couple are approaching the house where there's the first encounter with Leatherface and yeah. everything is leading up to that moment. And I mean, you said you think it's one of the most frightening scenes in film and I would absolutely agree with that. And in fact, Bob and I were examining the Texas Chainsaw Massacre the other day as part of a Story Unboxed podcast. And I mean, it really does still stand up today, years later, decades later. That's one of my favorite films, which I know says a lot about me. Sorry, I'm a <laughs> terrible person. But yeah, that scene I was referencing where, I mean, there's so many fantastic things going on and I'm not going to do justice to them right now without it in front of me. But, you know, I'm remembering how bright it was to, to begin with. Like, you usually associate horror with darkness, right? But there's just this, like, this sunlight that's almost offensive, and it washes out the color and life from everything as this that young couple approaches that that house, you know, that that sort of rotten, rotten siding house. And uh, the camera pulls back, and we watch from a distance as they go near it. And it almost feels like, you know, somebody's hiding in the bushes or something. You know, you get that feeling a lot in John Carpenter's Halloween, too, where you feel like you're being, the characters are being observed from afar. And then they go up on the porch, and what's the first thing they encounter is there's, there's a tooth, you know? There's a tooth on the porch, and he pops it into the girl's hand, and she shrieks and, and abandons him. She goes off to the swing in the yard, which, of course, has those rusty chains on it, so it's shrieking away as he knocks and knocks and knocks. And, it, you know, the camera goes inside the house where it's like, almost as as dim as dusk and then it goes outside the house where it's painfully bright and it goes back and it's forth and as a result of that you feel really unsettled and and off balance and then there's that eerie eerie moment when he finally goes inside and and you see that red wall right that red wall full of animal heads and it's just like a focal point in a painting where you can't keep your eyes off it and that hallway that back hallway is just beckoning him and he has, there's something weird that happens with the camera or the, the speed of the film where he kind of stumbles and he see, it seems like he gets there too quickly. And, and you sort of have like this, uh, I don't know, like you can't get quite catch your breath. And, and then there he is. He's, he's, he's in the hallway and there's Leatherface and bam, right? Gets nailed. I can't remember if he gets nailed in the head by a baseball bat or a mallet, but he goes down and Leatherface just slams that door shut before you really even your brain can even process what has occurred and and you just understand like you see this vision of a nightmare and you see the guy dragged away and you just understand like those things those heads on the wall like he will soon be one of them you know he is he is prey and leatherface is predator yeah and i think with the violence with that single mallet shot that again, is talking about what you say in Thrill Me about turning the volume down, not up. There's no hyper stylization. He's not trying to titillate the audience. You just see the violence for what it is. And it's more shocking because of that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't like, I mean, I love Dawn of the Dead as much as anyone. and I love, you know, there's plenty of <laughs> wildly stylized, uh, you know, ridiculously violent sequences that I have, I'll admit, you know, cheered for in a darkened theater on occasion. But there's something to be said about violence uh, that's meant to horrify as opposed to titillate, right? Like, I, th I think that's a really effective example in Texas Chainsaw Massacre where it's just like thud, the mallet hits him, he goes down, the door slams, it's as matter of fact as you can get. It's not like, as a contrast, hostile, where the violence feels almost masturbatory. Mm. If, if that makes sense, where yeah. you know you see the, you know, the needle going into the eyeball or or whatever else, where it's just it's it's. I've heard the term torture porn before. You know, I'm that 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 sort of. I guess I've outgrown that sort of thing, and. Uh, I, I want, I'm, I'm thinking often about how violence is used in my fiction. You know, I want it to play uh, a, a role that feels justified. 
And I think maybe this came out of being a teacher too. Like when I was a professor and I was teaching these creative writing workshops, I was getting all of these stories turned into me and they're almost all by men, young men. And you know, the violence, as I said, would feel masturbatory, would feel titillating. And I would, I really started to question them in the same, and, and by questioning them, I was almost like questioning my like young Ben Percy. Because I know I, I was guilty of the same crimes early on. And I started to really look at movies and I started to really look at novels and short stories and like question the techniques and when they were most effective. And sometimes the violence is most effective when it's off stage. You know, that's that there's that Greek term, the obscene. And if you think about a Greek tragedy, the way that, you know, somebody would go off stage and behead someone and you wouldn't witness it. They'd come back on stage with a severed head and talk about how, you know, what happened. Um, and, and sometimes that's, that's really powerful. Like there's a movie, uh, frenzy, which is the penultimate film of Hitchcock and the killer in it, you know, you've observed this killer over and over again. And towards the end of the film, he walks this woman through a farmer's market and leads her up a staircase to an apartment and you know what's coming, but the camera lingers outside the door and the door closes and you just hear what happens. You hear a muffled thump, you hear a, a cry and that's it. And you're there for like another minute. And it's so painful and so terrifying because you're complicit in the act. Like you have to imagine what's going on in there and it makes you a co-author of the violence. And it's, it just, it's nauseating as a result of that more so than it would have been if we followed them inside. Um, so sometimes that's the best move, but other times, you know, other times you, I think you should show uh, the violence and, and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe because you're being instructive, you know, uh, this, this is not a horror novel. This is, this is real life. Uh, a, an essay called time and distance overcome by Eula Biss in that essay. She, <clears throat> she starts off by talking about <clears throat> telephone poles and telephone wires and Alexander Graham Bell and the history of tele, you know, the, the telephone in America and how difficult it was to convince people that these wires would be strung across the sky and, filter into every home and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of boring to start with. And she's lulling us along because of what's coming next. And what's coming next is halfway through that essay, there's a fulcrum point. It switches over. It starts detailing over and over and over again, all of the black men who have been lynched from telephone poles, who have been uh, tied to telephone poles and beaten or eaten by dogs or lit on fire. And it just goes through an, a, again, a matter of fact style. Uh, and it, and the result is, you know, that I saw uh, an auditorium full of people who heard Eulabis read this essay, and every single person in that auditorium was weeping by the end of it, right? And they had to, she had to give all those grotesque details for to have that emotional impact and for us to sort of recognize the sins of the past. And, and so what I'm saying is, you know, like, there's no one right way to do it, that you sort of have to think about, like, what effect am I, am I trying to have here? And I, always, I haven't always made the right move myself. These are just like questions I'm asking. Uh, and sometimes it, the questions are easier to ask when you're reading other people's stuff. Yeah, that reminds me of Robert uh, Roberto Bolano's 2666. Whenever it's in the, I know the third, the third section where he goes through all the, the murders in, in Juarez. And you've gone through these other two sections of, meeting these these characters and you you're kind of you're kind of elated because man he's good you know and the story's really yeah. really good and you get to that third section and you kind of realize this is where these people are living and this is what's going on in their world and it's just like it, it's it's numbing because he just goes after case after case after case after case and you're just like god <laughs> And so it, it, and but he, it, and it's, it's, it's deadpan. He doesn't go into, into like major details about it, but the violence that's in that section is effective. It works. It's, it, it hits you emotionally. Sometimes that matter of fact style, right? That's the best move you can make where, um, I'm trying to think of an equivalent, but there's an essay by Harry Cruz. And Harry Cruz is not usually referred to as a horror writer, but I would say mm -hmm. that's what he is. If you've read Feast of Snakes, <laughs> you know, that's, right. that's as terrifying as it gets. But he, you know, he's got this essay called Fathers, Sons, and Blood. And that essay just, it, 
it hurts so bad to read it, especially. Well, I mean, I was when the first time I read it, I was a new father, and I think that might add something to do with it. But it, it's all about how he discovers his son face down in the pool, dead, and he, you know he checks his carotid artery, and there's no pulse, and he tries to breathe for him, and and you know can't can't get him to respond, and that whole first page of the piece of the essay is just there, there's not a single moment when he says, you know, I felt uh, my guts boil over or I, you know, rage was pounding through me, uh, you know, or I cursed God or, or anything else. I was scared. It's just, it's purely detail of what happened. Right. And sometimes you just have to like, let the drama speak for itself. Uh, and that circles back to that whole mallet strike and Texas chainsaw massacre, right? Yeah. Because I mean, that one little instance of violence, is so effective. It sets the stage. It lets you know that what these young kids are dealing with doesn't care about their lives. Right. And that's that's probably the scariest part. Definitely. And, you know, the guy, the boy's wearing a blood-stained apron and, you know, a skin mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you know, for some reason, I can't I can't help but to think that there's actually a prequel that's coming out pretty soon. A prequel? Really? Yeah, it's called Leatherface. Another one. And it's, it's like, like part of me just like let it die. You're never gonna be as good as the first one. You'll never be as good as the first one. <laughs> I guess there's so many at this point that Leatherface, another one, might not be a bad subtitle. <laughs> Another face. Yeah. Another leather face. Right. Right. <laughs> We've got a number of questions on our Patreon. And yeah. the first one that I wanted to start with is from Thomas Joyce. And he says, The dark net seems to take on the eternal battle of good versus evil in a fresh way merging the historic idea of demons with our tenuous control over technology. How did this idea develop? You know, it wasn't all at once. It, it took some time. I think it started with um, a fateful week in my life, during which um, my sister's email was hacked, and I received several phishing scams in my inbox from her. My friend's Facebook feed was hacked. And my neighbor filed his taxes and discovered that somebody else had already done so and collected the refund. Our credit card information was stolen and used by somebody in Spain. And my father clicked on the wrong attachment on his laptop and the screen froze and a message popped up and it was being held hostage. You know, if he didn't pay a certain amount of money in bitcoins within the next 24 hours, they would erase everything on his hard drive. So all of these things happened in one week. And you know, I've always been interested in stories that channel cultural unease. Uh, and oftentimes those are, those are connected to technology. Um, you know, if you think about Frankenstein, go back to Frankenstein in the way that Frankenstein is all about the fear of science and technology. It's all about the fear of man playing God. Uh, look at Godzilla. Godzilla is all about post-atomic anxieties. Look at, uh, you know, all the post-apocalyptic and apocalyptic fiction that came out post 9-11. Um, that's not, you know, necessarily a, a, a tech issue, but, it, you know, it's all about sort of like taking a knife to the nerve of the moment. And, and we have so many things to fear right now. Um, you know, the, the fear of nuclear war. Uh, the fear that our democracy is being compromised, the fear that uh, of, of uh, environmental, dis you know, looming environmental disaster and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I think that a lot of people feel really vulnerable online right now. Um, and, and part of it has to do with this era of surveillance that we live in where every single swipe of your phone and every click of your mouse and every tap of the keyboard, right? That's feeding into an algorithm and you're being tracked by, by, by your habits online. 
Uh, and people are just so willing to, to give everything up, um, including photographs of their children and uh, checking in at different locations when they, when they go there um, and, uh, and allowing uh, Gmail to have access to their camera so that anybody who hacks into their account could potentially hack into their camera and observe them as they walk about with their phone. Um, and, um, you know, I started to think about how we can be, if, if, we, if you think about our phones, if you think about our tablets, if you think about our computers, which we're always turning our faces to, toward, you know, if you think of them as kind of like a prosthetic cerebrum, or if you think about all the information stored within them as a kind of receptacle for our souls, our identity, you know, that it's so easy to be pirated, it's so easy to be erased, it's so easy to be stalked, it's so easy to be possessed, essentially. And I started to see parallels between that and, uh, you know, classic demon stories uh, and possession, demonic possession stories. So, you know, I, I played around with the idea. And, and one of the things I like to do with any book that I write is, uh, you know, research it as deeply as I can. So I pitched an article with GQ and they sent me, it was all about, you know, trying to learn more about technology because I felt like a bit of a Luddite. And so I was going to immerse myself in tech for a month. So they sent me everything. They sent me Google Glass. They sent me like 10 Fitbits and three Apple Watches and uh, the SoundHawk technology that allowed me to eavesdrop on somebody across the room. And, um, you know, I got Apple TV and this and that, and the other. And, and then at the end of the month, I flew out to California and I toured the uh, Google campus and I got to ride in a driverless car and I got to wear their uh, Explorer pack, which has the same camera technology as the vans that map our streets. And anyways, I had this incredible experience there. And as I was talking to people there and people on the Apple campus and later on talking to executives at Verizon, um, you know, one of the things that came up when I was sort of pushing them on digital security was that the Russians and the Chinese were already inside the walls of virtually every institution in this country. And it was just a question of what they were going to do with that access. And then, you know, uh, whatever it was, a year and a half later, the news broke about what happened during the election. Um, and, you know, all of these things were feeding into what I knew was going to be a novel. I wasn't sure at first what shape it would take. And then then, you know, I just started to map out my characters and figure out plot points. And I wanted to, I wanted to have that digital world as, you know, if you think about the dark net, if you think about it is a place where, you know, some people go there for it rather innocent reasons. It, it is the dungeon of the internet. It is the basement of the internet. It is a wild west environment. You know, if you go on there, you're, if you're not completely anonymous, you're going to be tracked by the NSA. Um, and some people are down there for innocent reasons, though. I know you probably know some college student who's down there downloading uh, the latest Jay-Z single for free or watching Game of Thrones for free. Uh, but there's also people down there who are getting mail-order heroin. And there are people down there who are, um, you know, doing mur murder for hire or or there's this business of shaming right now. Like if you want to see somebody shamed, you can hire somebody in the dark net and they'll hack into their phone or hack into their computer and release all the damaging information about them. Um, you can, you know, ISIS is down there. Al Qaeda is down there, but there's also, you know, there's, and there's every disgusting manner of porn you can think of down there, but there's also like embattled journalists in areas and bloggers in areas where they'll be prosecuted if if their identity is is known so they're you know uploading articles and uploading blog entries from these anonymous um you know internet internet hubs and anyways it's like this it's, it's this total wild west as i said this lawless frontier but there's a lot of darkness gathering there and so it makes sense that i could do something like a 21st century version of uh you know a, a demon narrative and and have them using the internet as an as an access point uh, for for infesting us all. Wow, that's very relevant to my 
to my day job work because I, I work for a cellular company mm -hmm. in sales <clears throat> and it constantly have to tell customers to be careful where they go yeah. we get people come in and you know it, they they've got their phones are just are jacked up you know and they, they don't know why and i can look you know i hit one little thing on the search engine you know and it's nothing but porn I'm like, really? Okay. Well, that that's why, you know, kind of have that private conversation, sir. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the big boobs videos you've been watching, yeah. Those come with viruses. <laughs> you know? I'm like, really? I didn't know that. That's why my phone jacked up. Yeah. But you just you have to be careful. Uh yeah. because it doesn't take much to get to you know, basically not necessarily, you know, the, the dark net, but you can get on the fringes of it pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it's pretty easy to get on the dark net. You just download a special browser called Tor, and away you go. Mm, yeah. A anybody can do it. You just follow a few screenshot um, instructions on Google, and it'll get you there. So the other thing that's interesting, you, you, you probably know about this if you're working in wireless, um, you know, because I was talking to some people at Verizon, and they didn't want to be listed in the acknowledgments because they were telling me about sort of the sensitive situation with, uh, you know, the databases where everybody thinks about wireless as wireless. And every tower, of course, has these wires tentacling from it underneath the ground, feeding into these data centers that are in every city. Right. And you can easily access those wires through the sewer system. And these databases are not guarded. There's like one security guard who's probably asleep and a numeric keypad that leads into the data center full of all these blade server servers that all the information is streaming through. Right. And you could really do some damage to uh, an urban area by taking out one of those facilities. Or there are ways you can hack in, especially, or get in and go beyond the fire firewall and get inside of uh, all the information streaming through there. Yeah. Once I, once I got into to cellular, it, I, I realized how S Stephen King's cell worked. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, you know, cause it's like, how did that, how did that happen? A signal? How did they do that? And it was like, you know, once you get, you start learning about, you know, the, the signal and where it comes from and, and all that. And it's not, and like you said, it's not exactly completely wireless. Uh, yep. And it, it's, it's vulnerable and you know, and people, you know, it, it, it's amazing when, when it, it, if the signal goes down that people lose their minds and I'm like, Hey, don't you understand that the signal we're lucky that it works every single day that it does work <laughs> because there's so many things that could make it mess up. <laughs> well, I think another technological concern at the moment is the rise of artificial intelligence and the robots that we're creating. And it's something that Sam Harris talks about a lot, saying that we've already got to a point where the advances in technology are such that in a matter of decades, we are going to be creating artificial intelligence that is exponentially more intelligent than we are. And we've just got to decide, are we going to use that for a force for good? Or, well, I think we know what the equivalent could entail. Is that something you've looked into or something that you're concerned about at all? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, we've all seen Terminator 2, right? right. Um, <laughs> I know the T-1000 is coming for me. <laughs> and But yeah, I, mean, I think especially... You know, here we have, is it Alexa? You know, the, the Amazon device that just sits yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is always waiting to be summoned. Uh, and as our homes become more smart, and as our, you know, we're, we're talking back and forth with Siri all day, asking her things, and she's listening as well. Um, and as our tech becomes more enmeshed, not just in our homes, but in our persons, because... You know, we're, we're, some people already have technology in their heart. Uh, some people have tech in their eyes or their ears. Um, 
some people have insulin pumps. Like it's just going to get more and more intense from here. Uh, some people are already microchipped. I don't know if you've heard about that recently, but an employer uh, is microchipping it. It's, uh, you know, the people who work for it. And, and you know, we're going to get to a point, and I, I can't necessarily anticipate the technology, but you know, we're getting to a more sort of cybernetic situation where your whole body could be hacked. Your life could be hacked. Scary stuff. So it's not just, you know, the robots taking over. It's like we are going to become more and more reliant on the robots and they can, you know, they, they don't have to, a robot doesn't have to kick down the door and, and you know, and, and steal your house from you. The robot is already there. Yeah. You, you said that there's some employers microchipping employees. Did, could you tell us more about that? That's fascinating and terrifying. Yeah, it's it's been a headline lately, and there was an NPR segment on it, and uh, they're asking their employees to be microchipped. And there was another story I heard about um, uh, this new app, and this new device, that if you have elderly parents or grandparents, you can track their heart rate and their insulin and uh, their location through it. So, you know, it's like a really intensive kind of babysitting app. Mm. Um, you know, right now parents are studying their phones as their teenagers run about town and making sure they are where they're supposed to be, you know, with the, have that location finder as well on that. And, and yeah, I mean, we're, it's just one more example of surveillance being stepped up. Yeah. Oh, definitely. We, we, we sell basically tracking devices, you know, that when people can actually install in their vehicles. And they originally came from, you know, from corporate sales because if you got like a fleet of trucks, you want to keep track of your drivers, make sure that they're safe and all that. But now that's come to the consumer end, and uh, you know, a, a lot of and a lot of people like it. I'm not gonna lie, but occasionally you get, you know, you, you be kind of pitching it to a customer, and they're like, "Are you are you serious? There ain't nobody else tracking me. It's bad enough with a phone, buddy." <laughs> I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. Thanks. <laughs> you know, and just like, yeah, I, I get it. A good Texan right there, right? Yeah. Don't, you know, don't step over that line. Oh, I'm yeah. my own man. We're our own state. And you're not, I don't want big brother looking over my shoulder. Yeah. That's, and it, it, but you know, the thing, I think the thing with the microchip thing, I think it was in the, uh, it, that it was strictly, you know, uh, you know, you could choose if you wanted it or not. I don't think it was like, hey, if you're getting this microchip, or you're losing your job. But, uh, but they, of course, you know, any, any mention of that, it's going to be, you know, it's going to make headlines. But I think we're going to yeah. see more and more of that in the future. And it may have yeah. well, well, good intentions. But I mean, there's always that, you know, one rotten egg in the in the, in the dozen that can use it for yeah. for evil and nefarious purposes. You know, you know, that you're born and then you're circumcised. You're <laughs> And microchipped. <laughs> yeah, time. exactly. Well, our second question, again yeah. from Thomas Joyce, is about Thrill Me. So he says it's garnered a lot of praise from both literary and genre writers, but there are also a lot of mediocre how to write books out there, not to mention websites, blogs, and podcasts. Are there any sources on the craft you would recommend to aspiring writers? Well, that's nice of him to say. Thank you, Thomas Drews. Um, yeah, sure. You know, and I, I vary my diet, my literary diet, every, every chance I get. And I, I try to read poetry as well as prose. I try to read books that were written 100 years ago and books that are written right now. I try to read nonfiction and popular novels and indie presses and I try to read across sexual and gender and religious and political boundaries you know I'm always trying to shake things up in my head to become a better person and writer and part of that's reading craft books I try to read at least one craft book a year just because you know the annoying thing about craft books is they're telling you how to write but the cool thing about craft books is if you just approach them like the same way you would approach a class. If you took a creative writing workshop from somebody, every professor has their own 
stance, right? And if you take a bunch of workshops from a bunch of different people, you come to understand like, okay, the seven things that that, that person said, I really, I really dig that. I like that idea. Those other three things, nah, that's not for me. And then you take another class with somebody else and you're like, you know, those, those five things, those are definitely worth chewing on. Those five things that they kept harping about. But those other 10 things I totally disagree with. But the good thing about disagreement is that, you know, it, solidifies your own vision and so i think it's really healthy to be just exposing yourself to different people's principles on craft and what makes for a good story what makes for a good poem what makes for a good song what makes for a good video game or film or whatever and i love Charles. The, there's a series called the art of series it's put out by gray wolf press um so it'll be like the art of time and the whole book will be just about how the treatment of time in fiction, you know, when to speed things up, when to slow it down, how to write something that takes place over a hundred years, how to write something, a story that takes place in a few minutes and, and whatever else. My favorite one of those though is called The Art of Subtext and it's by Charles Baxter. And just really getting into, you know, the what's beneath the surface of stories and how to how to handle that in a way that's not bullying how to handle that in a way that's not too obvious, like to have that thematic current running under your work. And he's the Charles Baxter guy. He's, he's a smart dude. Um, uh, I love on writing by Stephen King. Of course. Um, I think that bird by bird by Anne Lamott has some interesting points in it. I disagree with a lot of it, but I, I like it as a book. Um, you know, I, I have to say that I've gotten a lot out of screenwriting books. And I think that screenwriters have, maybe this book is out there, I don't know. But I was trying to find a book years ago that taught me how to write a novel, that really got into structure, that really got into plot. I couldn't find one that I liked. Uh, and of the books that were most heralded, like Art of Fiction by John Gardner and How Fiction Works by James Wood, which, you know, both those books are great, but they're very artsy fartsy and don't really get into mechanics. And I think that that's common in a lot of creative writing workshops too. And I guess, I think, you know, everybody's focusing on the sentences and everybody's focusing on characterization. And everybody's focusing on theme and the artfulness of it all. And that is really important to me, but you know what? Plot is not a dirty word people. And, and I think it's just a lack of, I think it's prejudice. Like in the ivory tower, there's kind of a lot of, prejudice towards genre fiction. And uh, I think that people just don't understand plot. They don't know how to do it. And so it's easy to put it down. Uh, so I was looking at some of these screenwriting manuals and you know, you look at, um, I think it's called Screenplay by Sid Feld. That's a fantastic one. So is Robert McKee's story. That's probably the most famous of them all. Um, and it gave me a lot of insight into the superstructure of film, you know, the skeleton behind it all. And that's, that's something I started to unpack on my own. Like I, it, I understand that there are differences between movies and novels. I'm not trying to say that the exact same thing, but if you carve everything else away and just look at the beats of a story, they are very close cousins. So I started to, Read, when I'd, I'd read like Robert McKee's story and then I'd read a novel and I'd try to apply that same rubric and it was really an interesting process. I started to understand what was underneath the hood of it all. And I think some of these novelists might just instinctually be doing this and not consciously doing it, but it was super helpful for me because I'm more of a analytical process guy and I like to make blueprints of my, you know, of my stories before I start them. Um, so I would, I would strongly recommend those and, you know, just to, clue you into my process. Like when I was writing short stories early on, I was having a little bit of trouble. I thought with plot. And one of the things I did was did what these screenwriting manuals were doing with movies, you know, and broke them down bit by bit. So I took somebody who I thought was really good with structure and that was Flannery O'Connor. And I read one of her short stories five times to emotionally disengage myself from it, to know it in and out. And then I just went through and I made a blueprint like beat by beat, paragraph by paragraph, what was happening in the story? Like, Okay, paragraph one, 
uh, setting is described as a way of announcing the theme or character A introduced via dialogue and weakness, his central weakness is, is hidden inside of that line. And then I'd go through and then I'd have, I'd write a story as an exercise that was based off of that same skeleton. And I would do something different. Like, let's say if the theme was introduced via setting in the opening paragraph of the Flannery O'Connor story, in the opening paragraph of mine, you know, maybe the theme in the Flannery O'Connor story was all about, uh, um, I don't know, forgiveness. Maybe my theme had something to do with vengeance. Uh, you know, if the character's weakness in the Flannery O'Connor story was introduced via dialogue and that weakness was jealousy, you know, maybe, maybe the character in my story, the dialogue would reveal that uh, they were, uh, you know, they, they thought that they were the greatest person on earth, that they had this, you know, oversized ego, this high, this high view of themselves. And that was going to be their weakness in the story because that made them vulnerable there. And anyways, I went through and I did this like three times with three different stories as an exercise. And I just clicked, like I knew how to do it. I knew how to plot a story. It took me a long time to figure out how to do that with novels. Um, it was, it wasn't until years later, I'd written four failed novels before I published one. And I, and then I just started doing the same thing. I'd go through books that I admired and I'd map them out. I'd blueprint them. I'd read them several times. I think there's a lot of value in rereading, just as I think there's a lot of value in rewatching movies. Uh, you know, if, if a book, if, if, even scenes, like if I watch a scene and I feel terrified, I'll rewatch it to figure out how, how did the director make me feel that way? If I read a scene in a novel and I'm like, holy crap, I feel like I want to cry right now. I go back and I reread it and figure out what tricks were used. So anyways, I do this blueprinting, I do this map making. And I'm, you know, it's, as a writer, you're, you're just figuring out how to emotionally manipulate people, really. That's what telling a story is all about. So I'm figuring out the component parts that create terror, that create humor, that create sentiment, whatever. That's what these craft books have done well for me. And um, so I'd recommend, you know, the super literary ones like The Art of Subtext. And I'd also recommend the more mainstream ones like Robert McKee's story. I'm definitely going to have to get that book, The Art of Subtext. That sounds like it's right up my alley. It's a genius one. Now, I appreciate the uh, recommendation there because I'm going to get that book very soon. Mm. And this idea of melding the best of genre and literary, I mean, this is at the heart of your nonfiction book, Thrill Me. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what was the lack of people talking about genre and literary as a kind of cohesive unit? Was that one of the inspirations for writing the book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're not part of the whole MFA circuit, you know, if you're not part of a bunch of these creative writing workshops, um, you're not necessarily attuned to this, but you know, I walked into so many different classrooms as a college student and was told there will be no genre fiction. And anything that had a slight horror, or slight science fiction element to it was dismissed as genre in the class. And I don't know, it was really stifling because I came into that class like ready to write some Conan the Barbarian stories. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it just came to the realization eventually that like, well, all right, I love Leslie Silko and I love James Baldwin. I love Raymond Carver and I love all these literary writers that I'm being introduced to. Um, but like, I also love um, Dean Koontz and Shirley Jackson. And I love, um, you know, Octavia Butler. And I love um, Anne Rice. And, and a lot of these tricks and, you know, as you're learning about the three dimensionality of characters and how to render that, if you're learning how to create these subterranean themes in your fiction, as you're learning about how to craft a sentence, like a lot of these writers who are so-called genre writers, like Peter Straub, like he's doing the same damn thing. Um, so is Margaret Atwood. So is Dennis Lehane. So is Larry McMurtry, right? 
those are they write um you know they've written some masterpieces and uh i just i guess i just became really sick of this these barricades that kept getting set up and i wrote this book in part as a response to that like just embracing embracing the high the so-called high and the so-called low you know just examining songs that I loved, examining comics that I loved, examining films and TV and poems and, and, and novels and just trying to figure out what's the best possible way to tell a good story. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to go through the rest of the Patreon questions so we can get to all of them. Sure. My dog in upstairs in case you can hear that yeah yeah i can <laughs> so where will the background well I, I, how I, appropriate I, I thought, yeah i thought some sort of hound in the background was just so appropriate sure. given the dark net <laughs> to the baskervilles right so <laughs> jake marley says do you tackle storytelling in comics differently than in your other fiction do you outline them? Oh, you have to, you have to. Uh, that's because of editorial pr approval, you know. Um, you have to first write an overview, and that says, like, what am I going to do in these four issues or these six issues? What's the plot? What's the emotional arc for each of the characters? That gets, you know, talked about with the editors, and then, you know, they fiddle with it a little and talk to you, and. And then you move forward to the beat sheet. So every single issue you have to write a beat sheet for. So page, on page one, what's going to happen? On page two, what's going to happen? You know, you give like these quick summaries. That gets, you know, discussed. Then you go to script. And you're finally able to go through panel by panel and knock it all out. But there's going to be a lot of edits from there. That's a guarantee. Um, it's a very strenuous process and a very, I guess, if novels are a, a marathon, you know, writing comics, that's a sprint. It's a very busy, high-stress environment. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of different things that I've learned from writing comics that I think are going to make me a better novelist. And part of that has to do with the story math of it all. You know, comics are tight. Like, it's 20 pages. It's five to seven scenes. You only have so much room. And there's an A plot, a B plot, a C plot, and a D plot. And the B plot of one issue becomes the A plot of the next. The C plot becomes the B plot of the next. And so on. So there's this rotation occurring. There's also a kind of math involved with uh, your layouts um, and how and the pacing. And let's say a splash page by page four, you should have some sort of you know deepening mystery that opens up the issue to hook people. And then by page four, there's usually a splash page. That's a single image on that page, and it should be on the page four because if it's on page five, it'll be on the right, and people will turn the page and they'll skip page you know, that left page and look to the right one instead. So you have to have a left page. So it's there with the page turn. And it's usually some moment of emotional significance or some moment connected to like an active set piece of great physical danger. There's usually another one of those at the very end of the issue too. And that's the advertisement for the next issue. Like on page 19, maybe Batman walks into a building, turn the page, page 20, final page of the issue. Building explodes. Tune in next time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm being superficial about it, but you know, these are just a few things that I'm always keeping in mind and that are carrying over. Like the constrictions, the tightness of the plotting, the story math of it all, that are carrying over to when I'm writing novels. And speaking of comics, how did you first get involved with Green Arrow? Well, I grew up a comics reader, an obsessive comics reader. I fell out of it a little in college when, you know, I could buy comics or I could buy beer. I chose beer. Um, and then I, I published this book for short stories called Refresh Refresh. And this guy named Scott Snyder published a book of short stories called Voodoo Heart. And I loved Voodoo Heart, and I was teaching it in some of the classes, uh, creative writing classes I was in charge of. And Scott Snyder was teaching my short stories from Refresh Refresh. And so we became friends via email. We talked on the phone. He started to bust into comics, and I was like, dude, I want to hit on that. I love comics. And I started reading them obsessively again and looking at his scripts and looking at his pitches. And I put together this big pitch for a series, and I sent it to Vertigo. 
and the series was called Red Moon. And it got rejected. But my agent loved the idea, and she said, you should write this as a novel instead. Well, I did, and I sold it, and that was my big book, my big, my breakout book. You know, it's a post-9-11 reinvention of the werewolf myth. Uh, it's epic, it's bloody, it's good fun. It might be the best thing I've ever written. And anyways, I, I didn't give up. I kept trying to get into comics. I kept sending them pitches, but stupidly, I kept sending them original ideas, and... I didn't have a track record in comics. They're not going to just give me an original series. I should have been sending them pitches for characters that already existed, you know, like a one shot idea or a two issue idea. So that same editor who rejected Red Moon, he eventually became the head of the back group, Mark Doyle. And, you know, he was getting exhausted with me because I just wouldn't leave him alone. How about this one? How about this idea? How about this idea? How about this idea? And finally, I think I sent Red Moon to him in 2009. It was 2014. He was finally like, fine, I'll give you something. And he gave me a two-issue uh, Batman story. So I pitched him this idea about an airport, Gotham International Airport, ending up quarantined. And I got accepted, so I made my debut with Batman. And, you know, that's a pretty auspicious debut. I felt very lucky. I knew a lot of eyes were going to be on it. I put everything I had into that story, and it paid off, you know. I ended up getting Green Arrow from there, and after I did a you know, decent enough job with Green Arrow, they offered me Teen Titans, and then I got James Bond, and yeah, comics have kind of taken over my life. That is so cool. <laughs> That's like one of the, the coolest stories anybody's ever told here, because I love comics, and I, I have those uh, Green Arrow issues, and uh, they're, they're, they're really good. And, uh, Lots of horror them too you know i'm definitely doing and it's uh yeah the the tv show has really kind of helped bring 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 green arrow back uh and i love the show and the only criticism i have is it's like everybody's so damn pretty but you know (laughs) it's it's not realistic it's like every every woman on the show is a stunner (laughs) and it's just like that's not really real life but okay i'll take it that's fine (laughs) green arrow's always showing off his six pack Yes, definitely. He's always, uh, yeah, all he's always got a chance to take off his shirt somewhere. It's like, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should give my Green Arrow a gut just to protest that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that would be great. That'd be awesome. I'm getting a little fat. Oh, well, I'll still be crime fighting. <laughs> but with so many projects and modes of writing, whether novels, comics, nonfiction, I mean, how do you manage your time and ensure you're productive? Do you have Mm -hmm. themed days or themed weeks where you're involved in deep work on one project? Or is it a case of kind of flitting between different things? Ideally, it would be deep focus on one project for a while. You know, novels especially require that. Uh, And I think I'm transitioning toward that again because I... have another novel I'm working on now and I really, I really need to sink into it. Um, but you know, with comics, you're needed every day, all day. Sometimes I get truly 200 emails just because Mm. of comic stuff. Wow. Uh, You know, they, what's, what do you think of this cover? What about the layouts on this page? Here are the pencils, here are the inks, here are the colors. Uh, we need to do another lettering script. Uh, we just heard that Black Manta isn't available, so we have to push that storyline down, you know, down the trail and whatever else. So, comics are, again, it's so much fun to write comics, but it's, you know, you got to be ready to work your tail off. Mm-hmm. And um, so, more often than not, I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on the novel for four hours this morning, and I'm going to go have lunch and maybe go for a walk or lift some weights or whatever. Then I come back to the keyboard. And, sort of hit the reset button and I work on comics. Yeah. And so, you know, end of the day, eight o'clock, get the kids in bed. I have to open that laptop again. You know, it's not, yeah. it's, I, I, I usually, there's at least, usually I work an eight hour day. I try to work an eight hour day. Um, but these days it's more often than not, it's more like 10 or 12. 
which is not healthy, but just the reality. Mm. I'm, I'm my own worst enemy for saying yes to work. Right. At what time? What kind of time are you getting up every day? Uh, well, the dog gets up at six thirty. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We've got two questions from Box Winnow, and he says, in regards to Deadlands, were there any apocalyptic scenarios or elements and concepts from fantasy novels you thought about or wanted to put a spin on that were left on the editing room abattoir? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a post-apocalyptic novel, but it very, it, he's right in that it is a, it is a dark fantasy novel. Um, and I was thinking about everything from the, um, you know, the journals of Lewis and Clark to the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings to Lonesome Dove and the road, you know, quest novels. Um, and I was also thinking about books like the name of the wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which I think did a brilliant job, especially of creating a kind of biochemical description of magic. Uh, magic system that was believable um, and started to get me really interested in fantasy again after I took a long break from it. Um, but things that ended up on the cutting room floor, like I'm trying to think of specifically what ended up on the cutting room floor. Hundreds of pages got cut and thrown aside. Um, and that happens with every book I write. My editor goes in and she's like, yep, yeah, we're losing this subplot. We're losing this character. We're losing. And, you know, I get pissed at first and then I realize you're absolutely right. And some of what wasn't working in the deadlines initially was that in a quest story, you want to make it seem like they're working really hard, getting from one place to another. But those transitions are oftentimes extremely boring. <laughs> and I love The Lord of the Rings, but I recently read The Fellowship of the Ring to my son, and that was a slog. Um, you know, there's a lot of descriptions of the in-between. And so one of the things that I did when going back and making the manuscript that much tighter was you'll see that I, um, I focus on stopping points and really cut away a lot of the fat, um, when it came to getting from one place to the next. So that's just one example of something mm. that was lost that, you know, ended up on the cutting room floor. No, with no disrespect to Mr. Tolkien, who was, you know, an invisible mentor to all of us nerds. Mm -hmm. Well, the final Patreon question from Box Wino. So he says, from reading your works and Thrill Me and what I've picked up from interviews, you have a wide background of influence of all types. I'm curious about the following, and these can be just general favorites or works you think are well worth studying for story. So then he'd like to know your top five important or influential genre novels, your top literary novels, and your top graphic novels. Oh, man. This is the sort of question you want to get in advance so you say the right thing, right? Right. <laughs> I'm going to blank out. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not going to do the top five for each of those, but I'll just list off a few that I you know, love dearly. Um, right. You know, it... And The Gunslinger are my two favorite Stephen King novels. And uh, I think that they taught me in many ways how to grow up. And that's why they're so important to me. Um, you know, I read The Gunslinger sort of a difficult point in my life. I mean, boo-hoo. My life hasn't been that difficult. But when I was in junior high, everybody, you know, junior high is the worst year of anybody's life. And I was a total screw up. And I was, you know, expelled from school for fighting and vandalism. And uh, I read the book in between. Uh, the two schools. So I was kicked out of one school, I was going to another. And read The Gunslinger, and it, became, it was very instructive to me. Like it, I sort of, I decided to model myself after Roland of Gilead. Um, you know, the way that some kid, it's a corny thing to say, but you know, when you're 13 years old, everybody's corny. And some kids wear the WWJD wristbands, and I might as well have had one that said WWRD. What would Roland do? Um, and it, it had a similar effect where I kind of grew up, like I learned a lot through it. I read it in fifth grade and I was the same age as the characters. And I was introduced to things, you know, very adult themes, very adult subject matter, 
in that book. And it also became very clear that, you know, adults aren't always going to be there for you to watch out for you. It made me think of myself more as like a in charge of my own life. Um, those are, I mean, I love Dune by Frank Herbert. That's, it's a, it's a book too. I couldn't read when I was younger. I just didn't have the patience for it to learn that new vocabulary and to understand the mythology and the religion of it. Um, science of it like but that's a book i read a few years back for the first time to completion and just like it blew my mind um i love kindred by octavia butler um great time travel book let's see for for literary fiction i always try to hawk um a short story collection on people because um short stories don't get enough love and Delicate Edible Birds by Lauren Groff is one of the great collections. Um, I also love Anthony Doerr's The Shell Collector, that book of short stories. And both of them have um, elements of horror in them. Both are very, very literary. Um, the Hunter's Wife by Anthony Doerr, that's in that collection, is one of the great short stories of all time, I think. And it has to do with a woman, I guess you could call psychic, or a kind of animal whisperer. Like if she touches... A person or if she touches an animal like a, a bear that's hibernating or you know a, a, a dog she can see into its mind um and it's just it's really beautifully done um other novels that i love margaret atwood's the handmaid's tale which probably everybody is saying right now but i, I would have been saying that five years ago before the tv show as well um susanna clark's jonathan strange and mr norell is one of my top tens i think um and that's one of those things. It's like, is it a fantasy novel or is it a literary novel? I, you know, I don't really care. Most people might call it a literary novel, but it's shelved often in fantasy as well. But it's you know basically like a Jane Austen meets Harry, I don't know Harry Potter or <laughs> something like that. Um, and what else was I supposed to talk about? What so other the, books? the final was Gra graphic novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, the 80s, 90s were like the, the height of awesomeness. Um, and if I'm looking to like a lot of the Vertigo stuff from back then, like Sandman and Swamp Thing, Alan Moore Swamp Thing, um, and uh, Hellblazer, Garth Ennis, or Preacher, um, or Frank Miller's work which is Dark Knight Returns, like, that's that's the ultimate for me. Okay, well, I know that we've exceeded our hour. Do you have any time for any further questions, or shall we cap it at that? Uh, I just, I'm really grateful for uh, the conversation and for you getting the word out on my stuff, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you, and... This has been really useful in terms of writing advice and I just can't thank you enough for Thrill Me and for the novels that you've put out in the world. I mean, they've really enriched my life. So thank you very much. And, you know, I hope that perhaps for your next release, we can do this again sometime. I would love that. Please. Let's, let's make it happen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, wh where... Where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, you can find me online. Um, so I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. And every time I, you know, post, I'm full of self-loathing, but, but I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think you'll fit in nicely then. <laughs> okay, well, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks again for a great conversation. Yeah, yeah. We're back at you guys. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast with Benjamin Percy. Yes, that was awesome. He is uh, such a uh, wealth of knowledge uh, and just I'm, I'm inspired <laughs> to tell you, you just just listen, just listen to him talk about writing. It's awesome. Hey, me too, and it's before 10 a.m. here, so I've got much of the day ahead of me, so I'm going to be spending a lot of it writing.
there you go. Now, before we wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. How well do you know the people you chat with online? 37-year-old Ellie Blake is about to find out when she joins a dark online forum seeking a suicide partner. When she meets Laurie, she thinks she's going to a nowhere hotel for a night of sex, torture, and suicide. But what awaits her is a sadistic force even suicide offers no escape from. He might be God or maybe the devil, but in the end, he wants all of humanity brought to his knees. Award-winning author Nicole Cushions, The Sadist Bible, is cosmic, transgressive, suspenseful, a story that has not been since Clive Barker's Hellbound Heart. From Zero One Publishing, The Sadist Bible is available on Audible and where paperbacks and ebooks are sold. And we're back. And since I have the privilege of you being here for the outro, Bob, I'd like to know what is it that you've been reading and watching recently? Well, I've been actually, uh, I've been reading The Darknet and uh, I'll be finishing that book soon. Uh, it, it's it's really good. Uh, it's uh like I said, it's 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 keeping me up at night. I like that. I'm about to start reading a, a lot of uh, gothic fiction. Um, I'm going back into some of the fiction that uh, I kind of passed on when I was younger because I didn't understand what gothic meant. So I'll be diving into that, and I'm going to be uh, starting to read uh, The Monk by uh, Matthew Lewis. Right. And uh, from what I understand, that is a... Uh, I wish I'd have known it, you know, back when I was in college, but uh, it is a uh, hellish ride from what I understand. And uh, we'll be diving into that. been reading uh, a lot of Peter Straub and uh, just, you know, uh, me and uh, Benoit's uh, little uh, Straubathon is uh, coming to a close pretty soon. We've got two books left. And so just got done with Floating Dragon, about to start reading uh, Shadowland. Mm. So uh, what have you been reading, man? Well, I mean, apart from the obvious, which would be The Dark Net by Benjamin <laughs> Percy, I've been reading in terms of non-fiction. You might remember that Philip Fracassi recommended a number of craft books, and mm-hmm. one of the ones that I had never read before is The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. So mm-hmm. I've been reading that while simultaneously planning a novel and usually I mean I will plan to a point so I'll know what's going on in a lot of the key uh, in a lot of the scenes particularly the key scenes there'll be a little bit in terms of character sketches but you know you can put most of my plans on a page or two but I don't Let's see what happens when I follow much of what Truby advises within a book. And I'll tell you, it's incredibly detailed. I think my only criticism at the moment is to emphasize a point, sometimes there's a little bit of repetition. Whereas if you look at a story by Robert McKee, he tells you what you need to know he gets in he gets out job done but this is maybe the most in-depth book that I've read in terms of just like laying the foundations for story structure so I'd recommend it um I've also been reading the non-fiction book Deep Work by Kel Newport so I mean that is what it says it is really just talking about how to make deep work work for you so the idea of having uninterrupted stretches of work where you're only focusing on one task and that is a great read in terms of fiction i can't really say much about it because i've only just started reading it 
but I'm starting The Elementals by Michael McDowell because I've never read that. So I I try to ensure that I'm reading a contemporary book and then a classic, whether that's a horror classic or just a kind of great classic from literature. And The Elementals is the book that I've gone for and so far so good. Have you read it at all? Yes, I read it years ago, and that, that's that's kind of one of my things with going through the Gothic literature is uh, going you know all the way down to like the beginning of it, and I want to I want to you know go through the the times because everybody thinks Gothic well was, you know it was written a long time ago. No, it's not. I'd say that Michael McDowell probably hit hit on a lot of a lot of the levels that Gothic you know, tapped into. Mm. And, uh, so I read it years ago. I loved it. Uh, I do have, uh, the original paperbacks of Blackwater now. This, uh, the serial series that he did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, paid good money for him, but, uh, I'm glad I got them and I'm going to read them. Mm. And I think that's, that's going to be kind of, you know, getting into, you know, the more modern day Gothic, uh, even though that would be probably closer to Southern Gothic horror, but uh, his M- McDowell's awesome. Yeah. And if you haven't read it, read Toplin. That's like uh, Dave, I mean, Michael McDowell does David Lynch. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm sold. I'm going to do it. And in terms of what I've been watching, in terms of film last weekend, I watched two South Korean movies. I watched Train to Busan and I watched The Wailing. And I thought that Train to Busan was excellent. It kind of comes down to what Victor Laveau was saying the other day that you don't have to have an original story. You just have to be able to tell it well. And in terms of the sense of pacing in terms of the character arc, in terms of everything about that film, it absolutely nailed it. So in spite of it being a zombie film, which we've seen a a real glut of zombie films in recent years, in the last decade or so, in fact, but it did it well. It for my money, goes right up there in terms of the best zombie films up there with Romero's stuff up there with 28 Days Later. So that comes highly recommended. The Wailing, not so much so. Um, it started off reasonably enough. I would say that the resolution was pretty silly and that really it was a bloated film it it, it has a running time of two hours and 36 minutes and if you do that you better bring your a game you better bring something that warrants that running time like the godfather but really i felt it could have been tightened up um and For all the reasons that Train to Busan was good, the whaling just suffered and was really a five or a, yeah, five out of ten, I would say. In terms of the protagonist and character development, I wouldn't really say there was any transformation. He didn't seem to have a self-revelation and he didn't really seem to have progressed on a deep level. Um, It all just felt... A little bit middle of the road and you know also he wasn't a particularly likable character but he also wasn't interesting enough to warrant him not being likable and like I say the the ending was poor I won't give I won't really go into detail on that in case anyone wants to watch it but also I'd recommend don't watch it come on life is too short and it's an average film so there you go have you seen either of those 
No, I haven't. I haven't seen uh, the whaling. I've heard hit or miss about that, but everything I've heard about the train to Buscan is 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 really really good. But lately, I've been watching classic. You know, uh, getting into uh, Argento films. Uh, they put uh, Suspiria on uh, Amazon and uh, Amazon Prime and. Uh, yeah. So you definitely, you know, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Uh, weird, strangely enough, I thought I'd seen it before, but uh, I didn't. Never, <laughs> and, you, had, uh, you had never seen Suspiria. No, I never it's seen such it. Such a good uh, film, and it, it, it is so well done in d- done in terms of giallo and that kind of Italian horror. I mean, oh, really, yeah, Argento created that. Right. And, and so I've been going through the Shutter, you know, library. They don't have a lot of his films on there, but they they have Inferno, uh, which has got one of the most uh, suspenseful opening tracks, the underwater scene. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd seen that film. I had actually seen that film years ago, and but I forgot about that scene. And and uh, when she when she uh, moves that thing and the corpse comes up, it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched. Uh, I watched Black Sabbath, and uh, that was uh, that was quite interesting. I'd never uh, and I'd never seen it before, uh, and it was uh, though you know I'd heard about it, and I think the thing that kind of stirred me away from it was the fact it was it's an anthology. But man, it was good. It was very creepy. Uh, it was it was crazy. It was uh, and it's Italian, mm. and uh, you know, but you have Boris Karloff in there, and it's just oh man. Classic stuff. So yeah. that, that's what I've been getting into lately. It's just, you know, watching a lot of films. Um, it seems like Shudder's kind of bringing their A game. Yeah. And getting, getting some of this older stuff. And, uh, you know, it's like, man, I wish they had better content. The content is, is coming. It takes time. You have to, you have to plot, you know, you have to apply for the license and all that kind of stuff. And it just takes time. But they, they're, it seems like they're really trying. And shoot, for five bucks a month, you can't go wrong. There's a ton of ton of content on there so i'm not trying to advertise them for them but i'm just telling people you know hey it's it's you might want to check it out all right well we will wrap up with a quote but before then just a reminder that if you like what we do if you think we're worth one dollar per month then please do support us on patreon www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror you get early bird access to every episode You can submit a question for our guest, as was the case with Benjamin Percy today. You get to submit questions for our Patrons only Q&A. If you take your sponsorship up a little bit to $3, then you get access to Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. And the next story that we will be unboxing is Day of the Dead. So I knew that was going to win. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, well, there's your winner. <laughs> yeah. So please support us. If you only have a dollar, but you want to give more, but you can't, don't feel bad about that. Because if everyone who had a dollar supported us, the Patreon would be very, very healthy indeed. And we would be very happy. Yes. And you want us to be happy because then we can bring you amazing episodes. So support us right. on Patreon. Definitely. You don't, don't want to see Bob when he's angry. You don't want to see me when I'm angry. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes me when I'm angry. Yeah. So obviously with you on the call for the outro, I'm now like resorting to vaguely threatening people to support us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that, you know, 160 plus episodes it's come to this <laughs> well, I, yeah. could, I could come up with an even worse threat it's like support us on Patreon or I'm bringing Dan Howarth back <laughs> oh shit <laughs> <laughs> no one wants that <sighs> a joke we love you really Dan but Dan we love, but we do. We love Dan <laughs> okay. we need to have Dan back on the show he needs to come back on. Okay. You've heard it here, Dan. Come back. I need somebody I can pick on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But anyway, <laughs> let's end the episode on a quote. And this quote is from William Faulkner. Read, read, read. Read everything. Trash, classics, good and bad, and see how they do it. Just like a carpenter who works as an apprentice and studies the master. Read. You'll absorb it, then write. If it's good, you'll find out. If it's not, throw it out of the window. And that was William Faulkner. That's an awesome quote. It was probably all one sentence, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few sentences, but it's, it's a damn good it's quote. A joke. Yeah. It's a joke. It's a good quote, though. It's a joke. Hemingway, what he just said, read, 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 write, 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 it don't matter. <laughs> yeah, and that's because he's concise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, until next time, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great... Great day.